Good evening and welcome to our commemoration service for the late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Um, the service, everything's down on this service sheet and we're just going to let the, the service flow. We're, we are going to have an act of remembrance between the uh, prayers and the Lord's Prayer. We'll just have a maybe a minute, two minutes silence, however that goes. But I'll, I'll announce that when the time comes. So let's just have a moment's silence before we begin. So we meet in the name of Jesus Christ, who died and was raised to the glory of God the Father. Grace and mercy be with you. Today we come together to remember before God, Her late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, to give thanks for her life and to comfort one another in our grief. O oh God, make speed to save us. O oh Lord, make haste to help us. Blessed are you, Lord our God, lover of souls. You uphold us in life and sustain us in death. To you be glory and praise forever. For the darkness of this age is passing away as Christ, the bright and morning star, brings to his saints the light of life. As you give light to those in darkness who walk in the shadow of death, so remember in your kingdom your faithful servant Elizabeth, that death may be for her the gate to life, and to an ending fellowship with you, where with your saints you live and reign, one in the perfect union of love, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Psalm 23, a psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. An incredible passage which tells us that we, uh, we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We never stay in that valley of the shadow of death. I'm going to invite Sally to come up and read our second reading, Philippians 2, 1 to 11. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, 
Then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. To God. Thank you, Sally. standing for the reading of the gospel. 
Alleluia, alleluia. It is the will of him who sent me, says the Lord, that I should lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up on the last day. Alleluia. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink, or be baptised with the baptism with which I am baptised? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptised with the baptism I am baptised with, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. Then the ten Heard, when the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them, but not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Would you please be seated? May I speak in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We've gathered today to mourn the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II and to celebrate the legacy of her life and faith. As the nation has mourned the death of its longest serving monarch since Thursday the 8th, we've heard tributes to her pour in from all over the world. Prime ministers, world leaders and others have praised her dignity, her diligence, her intelligence, her warmth, and her friendliness. And yet over and above all of these excellent qualities, the refrain that I've heard over and over again, and I'm sure you have also, was that of her dedication to duty. Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II was the servant queen. Even before she became queen, the 21-year-old Princess Elizabeth famously gave a birthday speech saying, I declare before you that all my whole life whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. Therefore, from the moment of her accession to the throne upon the death of her father, King George VI, the tone of her rule had already been set. Indeed, at an event to mark her silver jubilee back in 1977, she affirmed the oath of her younger self, saying, When I was 21... I pledged my life to the service of our people, and I asked for God's help to make good that vow. Although that vow was made in my salad days when I was green in judgment, I do not regret or retract one word of it. Her oath was more than a sound bite. It came from the heart, something we see from the way that she consistently signed herself in her letters, your servant. Elizabeth. In an age of the kingdom of self, the kingdom of me, where I, with my wants and my needs, am at the centre of the universe, Her late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II modelled something profoundly different, profoundly countercultural. She showed a keen awareness that her privileged office wasn't something to be exploited for personal gain but used in the service of others. The Queen lived from a kingdom that was not of this world, an upside-down kingdom, a kingdom in which the King is the servant of all, the kingdom of God. She was consistently crystal clear where the inspiration for her life of public service came from, from her rich 
deep personal faith in Jesus Christ. Throughout her life, and especially in her Christ, uh, Christmas messages, the Queen acknowledged the centrality of Jesus as the source, the strength, the role model, and the pattern for her reign. In her Christmas message of 2014, for instance, she said, I hope that, like me, you will be comforted by the example of Jesus of Nazareth, who, often in circumstances of great adversity, managed to live an outgoing, unselfish, sacrificial life. Countless millions of people around the world continue to celebrate his birthday at Christmas, inspired by his teaching. He makes it clear that genuine human happiness and satisfaction lie more in giving than receiving, more in serving than being served. We can surely be grateful that 2,000 years after the birth of Jesus, so many of us are able to draw inspiration from his life and message and to find in him a source of strength and courage. And in her message of uh, Christmas 2012, she even mentioned the gospel reading that we've just heard, saying, this is the time of year when we remember that God sent his only son to serve, not to be served. He restored love and service to the centre of our lives in the person of Jesus Christ. However, what made the Queen such a remarkable figure in the public spotlight was that she didn't just talk about service. She lived it. Her late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II was not shy in telling the nation and indeed the world that she too was a woman under authority. She led as one who herself was led. Even the one to whom MPs and judges make their oaths of allegiance. She was up front that she herself had pledged her allegiance to King Jesus. Jesus wasn't just the truth she lived by. He was the way she lived and the life at the centre of her life. The Queen knew from personal experience that Jesus is the King in whose service is perfect freedom. But she wasn't the first monarch to discover that and to lead others as well. In the earlier we heard the well-known and well-loved words of Psalm 23 declaring the Lord is my shepherd. We seldom remember that these wonderful words were written by the shepherd of God's people, Israel's greatest king, King David. Like her late majesty, Queen Elizabeth II, King David knew that he himself needed to be led by God if he was going to lead like God. Indeed, it was the very fact of his being led by God a man after God's own heart that made him such a great king to his people. To be sure, that didn't mean he was perfect and didn't make mistakes because he did, some very big ones, sometimes on purpose. But even his mistakes served to drive him back to God, reminding him how much he, as a leader, first needed to be led by God. Even a king or a queen needs a shepherd. And King David's poetic words of Psalm 23 speaks to and speaks of some of our most basic human fears and wants. This is, I think, one of the reasons that we love Psalm 23 so much. We are hungry and we long to feed in green pastures. We are anxious and stressed and we long for refreshment by still waters. We are lost wondering what direction to go in, and we long to be led in the right way. We walk through deep, dark valleys, and we long to know that we don't have to face them alone, in our own strength. In short, we long for a shepherd of our souls. And the New Testament describes Jesus as the good shepherd, the flesh and blood personification of Israel's God. And even though the people of Israel had longed for a king messiah for centuries, Jesus didn't fit the profile of the saviour they wanted. And in our gospel reading, as Jesus and his disciples are heading towards Jerusalem in anticipation of his coronation, two of the disciples, James and John, ask Jesus to do them a favour. 
When you become king, they say, give us the top jobs in government. Let one of us be the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Let the other one be the Foreign Secretary. And Jesus replies, you haven't got a clue what you're asking. You see, Jesus' coronation, when it comes, is with a crown of thorns. The proclamation of his accession is a charge written above his head as he's executed on a Roman cross, the king of the Jews. And yet Jesus says this is no accident. He explains that what makes the good shepherd so good is that he lays down his life for the sheep. Or again, we hear the Apostle Paul speaking of Jesus in that second reading we heard. Not exploiting his divine prerogatives for selfish gain, but coming among us by taking the very form of a servant. Jesus says that it is the way of the world to use power and position for personal gain. But it's not to be that way with his followers. Why? Because that's not his way. The way of Jesus is the way of service and the way of self-sacrifice. The way of Jesus is a complete giving of self for the enrichment of others. He says of himself in the gospel reading that the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He died on the cross to free us from the penalty and power of sin. That is true greatness. Every death and every grief causes us to ask questions about our own lives. We become so much more aware of how limited our lives are. We ask questions like, what is the meaning of life? What am I here for? What happens after this? And Christians have always believed that there is hope in death as in life and that there is new life in Christ after death. Those who have known Christ as their shepherd in life therefore can walk through the valley of the shadow of death without fear. Today, as we remember the life of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, we're also encouraged to consider for ourselves whether we can say for ourselves from the heart, personally, the Lord is my shepherd, therefore I lack nothing. The Queen made no secret of the fact that she could say that. Can we? The good news of Christianity is that those who know God now as their shepherd will experience him as their home for all eternity. And so if you can't yet say for yourself, the Lord is my shepherd, perhaps you might ex consider exploring the claims of the Christian faith for yourself. You come to church, you could pick up a Bible and start reading one of the four stories of Jesus' life, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. You could ask someone that you know. You could even do it in memory of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Consider for yourself the faith that upheld her. Even the queen knew that she needed a shepherd. And there is room for everyone in God's sheepfold. My prayer for you and for the nation as a whole in its morning is that we experience the peace that comes from Jesus, the good shepherd, making us lie down in the green pastures of God's love. So may Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II rest in peace and rise in glory. Amen. <laughs>
At the end of the prayers and during the Lord's Prayer, I'm just going to offer a moment's silence just for your own thoughts. Um, just do with that time whatever you want. There is a picture of the Queen and candles to focus on. Uh, but it's just to mark a respect for Her Late Majesty, Queen Elizabeth II. So let's pray. Eternal God, our Heavenly Father, we bless your holy name for all that you have given us in and through the life of your servant, Queen Elizabeth. We give you thanks for her love of family and her gift of friendship, for her devotion to this nation and the nations of the Commonwealth, for her grace, dignity and courtesy and for her generosity and love of life. We praise you for the courage that she showed in testing times, the depth and of her Christian faith, and the witness she bore to it in word and deed. We pray for our, love, our Sovereign Lord, the King, and all the Royal Family, that you might reassure them of your continuing love, and lift them from the depths of grief into the peace and light of your presence. We say together, God of mercy, entrusting into your hands all that you have made and rejoicing in our communion with all your faithful people, we make our prayers through Jesus Christ our Saviour. Amen. And we'll just take a moment. So as we join together in the words of the Lord's Prayer, let us gather up all our prayers in the words Jesus gave us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And as we come to the commendation. Into your hands, O oh Father and Lord, we commend your servant, our late sovereign lady, Queen Elizabeth. Enlighten her with your holy grace and suffer her never to be separated from you. O oh Lord in Trinity, God everlasting. May God in his mercy grant us, with all the faithful departed, rest at peace. Amen. So Almighty God, the fountain of all goodness, bless our sovereign Lord King Charles and all who are in authority under him, that they may order all things in wisdom and equity, righteousness and peace, to the honour of your name and the good of your church and people, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Just before I give the blessing, at the end of the service, um, after the National Anthem, I just invite you to either come and light a candle or please sign the Book of Condolence at the back of church before you go. There is no time limit to go. Stay as long as you feel is necessary for yourselves. So please let me give you God's blessing. So may God, in his infinite love and mercy, bring the whole church, living and departed, to a joyful resurrection and the fulfilment of his eternal kingdom, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be upon you and those you love, today and always. Amen. Can I please ask you to stand as we sing together the National Anthem. 